Hi there, I'm Professor Blackmore, and I want to welcome you to ProfessorBlackmore.com, where our goal is to empower results through real productivity. And if you haven't been here before, I want to ask that you subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the bell down below so you won't miss any of my tips. And please also follow me on TikTok and Instagram. And today I want to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects and that is, you guessed it, contracts. And this particular topic was not on my content calendar at all because I'm working on numerous projects right now, but I'm tearing my hair out. And yes, I said what I said, my hair. But anyway, as I was saying, it is absolutely driving me up the wall to see these filthy rich artists like Dave Chappelle and Scarlett Johansson get caught up in what seems to be a never ending cycle of old school attorneys using the same form boilerplate contracts they've used in the 20th century. So boilerplate form contracts and agreements like industry studio contracts, like the ones most probably used or entered into by Scarlett Johansson may work for some situations, but in my opinion, they can add even more exposure for future civil and even criminal liability or money damage exposure because there is a loss of focus on what I call five critically important business issues. Now, this Scarlett Johansson situation with Disney is no different than the issue that Dave Chappelle was complaining about just a few months ago in his dilemma with Viacom CBS as a result of his prior deal with its predecessor, Comedy Central, involving royalties based on sales of DVDs. Yes, that's what I said. DVDs. And the contract was written using old school terminology based on industry standards of that particular time and of the past without any foresight or present sight for that matter as it relates to Scarlett Johansson into 21st century standards and technologies. Now, since the contract is silent or at least ambiguous about what happens when the studio sells the content in other format and even on top of that licenses the content to other streaming platforms and makes money on those sales as well, the artist screams foul because they have attorneys who do not know how to draft a contract that adds value to the deal. On the other hand, I draft contracts that add value to the deal because I'm like a dog with a bone when it comes to focusing like a laser throughout the entire contract on the client's major business goals. All right, so I'm just going to jump right in. And the first thing I want to do is I want to get a better understanding of what all the hubbub is really about as it relates to Scarlett Johansson's situation with Disney. So I downloaded a copy of the civil complaint. Okay. And so here is a copy of the complaint and I have all of my little notes here in the margin because right off the bat, I am able to spot a few problems here that I think are at the root of at least some of the major issues here. And as you can see, her attorneys opted for filing this lawsuit in a plaintiff friendly state superior court in Los Angeles, California. I absolutely see Disney removing this case to federal court because Disney is a Delaware corporation. In addition, they don't even name the streaming platform Disney Plus. If it, as a third party, 
is doing something that is outside of the terms of the contract and generating royalties that they claim belong to Scarlett Johansson, well, this third party would have the very records that are tied to the so-called lost compensation. But anyway, right on the first page, I can see blaring warning signs of exactly what some of the major problems are. And that is weak, most probably boilerplate contract language. And I'm not going to do a full course on the matter because anyone who follows me is probably sick of hearing me say the same thing over and over. But I've published books that are available on Amazon that can go into these principles in great detail if you're interested in reviewing them even further. And this is my latest book on Amazon called how to get away with contracts episode one how to write a real estate home purchase agreement there will be others in the series and right now i was thinking strongly about doing a licensing royalty deal transaction book next but i'll just say in general in my 5710 contract analysis i show you how to spot what i call five business issues or problems, seven contract concepts or what I call problem solvers and how to organize these problem solvers into 10 contract sections that I believe should be in any good contract. And the only way to determine what all of the business issues or problems are is to take each one of the client's major business goals and determine if any one or more of five business issues are present. To do this, I use my business issues worksheet. And so as you can see here, I have five business issues listed across the top of the chart. And they are money, risk, control, standards issues, and in-game issues. Now what you want to do is you want to use one business issues worksheet for each one of the client's major business goals. And I like to prioritize those business issues worksheets in importance of the most important being on business issues worksheet number one. And this would be goal number one. Okay. If you have a business goal that is prioritized as goal number one, you want to ask yourself, how does that goal relate to money? And it may inspire even more ideas about what the client's major business goal is and how it could be better worded in the agreement. And so you want to start by putting the client's number one business goal on business issues worksheet number one right here in this left hand box right here. And then as you go across, we're then going to try to uh, brainstorm all of the money, risk, control, standards, and or in-game issues that may result from that client's major business goal. And sometimes you may need to break the business goal up into elements so that you can analyze the separate parts of this particular business goal by looking at the money risk control standards and in-game issues for each one of the elements or subsections of that one particular goal when i first look at this situation two things pop right out and that is number one that scarlett johansson does not own the movie now that's not a big discovery but it's something that we need to be thinking about. So she is not going to be the first line licensor in any given distribution transaction. She'll never be the first line licensor. What's going on here, these royalties are, genera are generated for the most part from licensing of the content. And so the largest portion of her compensation comes from royalties that are tied in this particular context only to 
box office, box office, theatrical release of the content. And when you have a client in this position, you can't go with the industry standard for definitions of the meaning of certain terms. No, you have to make it clear what you mean when you say the words box office receipts or theatrical release. Because let's keep it 100. It can mean one thing to you and another thing to a company that is tied to a streaming platform or one that could in any way, shape, form, or fashion that could touch or concern a streaming platform. And you can't be weak about it because as Oprah Winfrey said in The Color Purple, a girl child ain't safe in a family of men. But anyway, so clearly the parties find themselves in court because there was a failure of a meeting of the minds amongst the parties. And I can see clear ambiguity surrounding the meaning of the aforementioned terms, the aforementioned very critical terms, and the parties also find themselves in court because of a failure to use contract concepts, aka problem solvers, to resolve business issues created by Scarlett Johansson's business goal or goals. And so the first thing that you want to do is you want to understand the critical importance of the client's major business goal. Okay, so when I look at the first page of this complaint, I can see Scarlett Johansson's major business goal just pop right out here. And that is that her compensation for starring in this role would be based largely on box office receipts generated by the picture. So you have compensation being based largely on box office receipts, which is a very narrow way to base your compensation. I'll look at that a little bit later. But then it was also to be based on a initial theatrical release of the film. Now, sometimes when you start working on this business issues worksheet analysis, you will start out understanding the business goal in one way, but that understanding will matriculate once you see it on paper. And so I'm going to write it in the narrow way that it seemed to be seen by Scarlett Johansson's attorneys at the time. And so here I have written it in this narrow way. And so here is the business goal here. Our Scarlett Johansson wants compensation to be based largely on box office receipts generated by the theatrical release of the picture in the first 90 to 120 days. And so while I can't understand why you would limit yourself to just box office sales, apparently the brick and mortar exclusive brick and mortar movie theatrical release somehow can boost the success of the picture generating more royalties for the artist. I believe the thinking is that if the initial release is also on a streaming platform, that is going to diminish the theatrical release sales. And apparently that has a lot, you know, of prestige when you hear about a movie that is in the top four, the top five or whatever. So I'm assuming it has some tie to that. But I tend to err on the side of the money. So to me, if you have royalties tied to all types of viewing formats, you never know what's going to happen in this time of uh, streaming. Uh, even before the pandemic, it was a very popular format. So whatever the case, and I could be wrong, but it seems clear that Scarlett and her attorneys did not contemplate that Disney would get into the streaming business and it never occurred to them that even if Disney did not, that it could actually license the content to other streaming platforms. This is a critical mistake in being able to look into the future, looking at in-game issues, being able to add value to the deal. You're not going to get this from using a boilerplate 
agreement. And so it seems that as attorneys, we're still living in the 20th century. We've got to bring ourselves to the 21st century and start to think about 21st century technologies. And so I just can't imagine that success and popularity of streaming was not contemplated, but one of the strengths of my business issues worksheet analysis is that it forces you to look into the future by looking at these end game issues and creating debilitating consequences for breach of promises and breach of representations and warranties. Now, people fail to understand that when you're at a point that you want to renegotiate a contract, that means you don't have a contract. Because when the metal meets the road, the client's major business goals are not sufficiently covered in the agreement or the so-called agreement that you think you have. Now, this is the exact same thing that happened to David Chappelle in the Chappelle Show transaction. And so this is one of the large sticking points that you run into when you have clients in a royalty deal under such a passive setup, when the client does not actually own the content. So, for example, if I own a thing, and based on what I knew in the past, I use that thing to make scarlet cakes. And I sold those scarlet cakes. And every time I sold a scarlet cake for $10, I had to give Scarlett Johansson $5, her $5 royalty. Now, that's all well and fine. That is what the deal called for, scarlet cakes, i.e box office receipts from theatrical sales. But I own the thing. Scarlett Johansson does not own it at all. So I can really do whatever the hell I want to do with it if the contract is silent or is vague or ambiguous. And so later on, I merge this company with another company or I create another division of my company that does not sell cakes. This division of my company makes pies and cookies. This division of my company is going to repurpose the cakes, i.e. the content, the movie, and make pies and cookies out of it. So the new division of which Scarlett Johansson may be fully aware. I seem to think that she had some idea of the existence at some point uh, about Disney Plus and what they were in the business of doing. She didn't have any idea of Disney, of Disney Plus. She should have, or somebody on her team should have known about streaming at that particular time, as early as 2019, when all of the different series of this particular film started to be uh, being made. And so she had some idea of this te technology. And so if this company, this new division of this com company is making Scarlet pies and cookies and selling them and Scarlett Johansson finds out how much money is made on the pies and cookies, well, you can understand where all of the frustration is coming from. In addition, we have a time now where we're going through a pandemic and it may be that more sales or a large majority of sales were made on streaming platforms. She completely cut herself out with such a narrowly based goal. And keep in mind, she's not Dave Chappelle. So she can't ask her fans to go out and boycott the movie and doing so might even undercut money she can still make from these Scarlet cakes. So she goes back and reviews the contract and the word Scarlet pies and cookies ain't nowhere in there. And so that's where we are in a nutshell. And so this goal may be a little bit too narrow and it's okay. Sometimes you have to write it out and you start, sometimes I will get all of the business issues. I may get here to the standards issue. That's when it start hitting, it'll start hitting me like a ton of bricks. But 
it's okay because this is the analysis process. And so what I need is a concept that will encapsulate this understanding that is broad enough to include old school industry understanding of box office receipts from theatrical sales as well as selling the ability to view the content in any and all other formats. You don't want to even limit it to streaming. We want to do that because my goal is always to look into the future. So I want to say any and all other formats. My new business goal is probably, probably going to have some wording like that in it. In addition, since Scarlett Johansson is not the actual licensor or owner of the content, how is she going to know when Disney or any successive owners or new divisions thereof, i.e. Disney Plus, enters into licensing agreements allowing individuals and other entities to sell the ability to view the content in other formats or if Disney licenses the content to Disney Plus and others allowing them all to have the ability to sell the ability to view the content in other formats. So these are the very questions or issues or problems that slip through and are not contemplated by form boilerplate agreements. So in agreements set up in a manner of relationships like this, all of the responsibility for paying royalties is borne by Disney Plus in this context because these are scarlet pies and cookies, not cakes. So the owner of the scarlet cakes grants a license to Disney Plus, okay? So the owner of the cakes, remember the scarlet cakes, they're owned by Disney. Disney then creates a separate company division grants that company a license, i.e. Disney Plus, to make Scarlet pies and cookies. So as you can see, the licensee, Disney Plus, is in a position where it will never really have any direct interaction with the talent, i.e. Scarlett Johansson. So now when you have a situation when the talent has a wholly separate business relationship or maybe even no relationship at all with the licensee, i.e. Disney+, Plus, Netflix, HBO, etc. And the talent, i.e. Scarlett Johansson, finds out that Disney+, Plus has licensed the right to sell the ability to view the picture, or that Disney has licensed the right to sell the ability to view the picture to Disney Plus and others in other viewing formats and Scarlett Johansson's original contract with Disney does not necessarily contemplate viewing in this particular format which it seems means that Scarlett Johansson does not generate any royalties during the initial release period for these views of that particular content then you can see why there is blood in the water. When I break this goal up, and this may be my second write of it, I may write it again and clear up some of the wording of this business goal, but you gotta have the business goal down so that you can then look at all the business issues. It can't just be just slap dash, just something. It has to be the goal, okay? And so the first thing I want to do is put in some type of mechanism that would count these views in any type of format. So I want to call that a royalty payment allocation because, again, we have a party who is in a very passive position in the contract. She does not own the content, and so she has to rely on the licensor to actually keep records that would keep up with this particular content, which could be a little bit different when you're looking at actual theatrical views 
of a content because that's something that can be uh, public, public knowledge. I mean, when those lists come out, they, everybody knows how many times uh, people went to the movies and purchased tickets for that. This is going to be something that's going to be a little bit different here. And so you need a way to be able to assess what counts as something that would trigger the royalty payment. OK, and so each time the picture is viewed in any format distributed by Disney as licensor or any other licensee selling the ability to view the picture in any format whatsoever. And so now I've broken this up into two parts. Now, the first part is going to be Scarlett Johansson wants the royalty portion of her compensation to be assessed by a royalty payment allocation because again when you have a client that's in such a passive license royalty situation uh, such as this one they uh, don't own the content and so they're going to have to rely on the licensor to actually calculate or keep calculations of each time the content is viewed or sold for viewing okay and so this is a little bit different from theatrical views which we know are more public when people go to the box office that information is released to the public and we know how many how much it made in the first week the first day and that is generated to the public and it's public knowledge okay this is a little bit different here and so you want to have a compensation base that is broad enough to encapsulate all of the different ways that the content can be distributed. Now, if there is any reason why uh, an artist would want to limit uh, the other releases or other formats other than the theatrical release because it may have some effect on the success of the box office of the movie but again I err more on making money <laughs> but if that's a concern then you can split these up but you don't want to leave yourself in a situation where you're in the initial release of the movie I would think and you have all of your compensation tied to narrowly one thing theatrical sales you never know what could happen streaming could be more at that particular time for whatever reason and if the company is going to be making money on other formats why would you not make sure that your compensation provides for some of those royalties as well in the first initial release of the picture but I'm sure somebody will chime in and tell me why. And so go for it. <laughs> anyway, if you have any comments about this, feel free to clap back at me. I have thick skin. I can take it. So you can just comment below and let me know what I'm missing here. Okay. And then the second portion of my goal is going to be each time the picture is viewed in any format distributed by Disney as licensor or any other licensee selling the ability to view the picture in any format whatsoever. A royalty payment allocation shall be calculated. OK, so that's going to create an obligation, a promise, a covenant that Disney is going to have to abide by if it enters into the agreement. It will be a uh, promise that they will be making in the future. OK, OK, so this is where I am in my analysis of this one business issue at this particular point in time. OK, so when I look at this portion that deals with the royalty payment allocation, I can see that's going to create a standards uh, issue re the definition of 
royalty payment allocation. So that's going to be an important definition in the agreement that I want to make sure that I don't forget to put in the declaration section of the uh, contract. And so as you can see here, the contract will in the end write itself because I am able to determine all of the business issues that are resulting from the business goal. I'm also able to just note briefly the contract concept or problem solver that's going to solve the problem or the business issue and the contract section where the particular problem solver or contract concept will go in the contract. And so when I look at this portion of the goal, each time the picture is viewed in any format distributed by Disney as licensor or any other licensee selling the ability to view the picture in any format whatsoever, a royalty payment allocation shall be calculated because now we have a definition of what royalty payment allocation means. And so what is the money issue? So there's going to be a loss of royalty if Disney or any of its licensees does not make Scarlett Johansson aware of all license deals and all licensees of the picture so that all possible royalty payment allocations are made. So this is my money issue that I can see. So I want to keep a laser focus on that in the agreement so that I can uh, establish all of the ways to uh, resolve this business issue. And so I'm going to have a covenant, i.e. Disney as licensor providing their obligation in section three of the contract as it relates to this money issue and controlling this money issue. Okay. And so then I want to look at my risk issue. So there's going to be some risk here. Uh, if Scarlett Johansson is not the actual owner of the content, the picture, she's going to have to rely on Disney as the owner or licensor to make her aware of licenses of the picture content. And if the licensor does not notify her, she won't know that a royalty payment allocation needs to be assessed. So there's going to be some risk there. I need to control that risk. Whenever there's risk, then there's going to be a control issue. Money is itself a type of risk issue, but it's so special that it needs its own uh, category. And so these are things that we want to control. I want to control this money issue also uh, with an obligation by the licensor to have an obligation. That obligation really is going to run through Disney because Disney is going to be the only party to this contract. It will enhance its obligation to keep track of its licensees. And so this obligation to notify Scarlett Johansson of any and all inquiries or any communications whatsoever regarding the license or use of the picture. And one would say, well, this will be something that would have to heavily be negotiated because again, she does not own the content. This is a little different from the Chappelle show scenario because Dave Chappelle kind of created that particular content. So this will be probably an issue that would ruffle some feathers. But like the Bible says, we have not because we ask not. And so I throw everything in the kitchen sink in when I'm doing my business issues worksheet analysis. And so as I'm going across, then I realize I need to have a definition of the picture. I'm going to work that out in the end, but definition of the picture includes dot 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 
viewed or sold for viewing in any technological viewing format that may exist in the future. Uh, I'm going to hold back on whether or not I want to have a specified definition of technological viewing formats because sometimes when you have a standards issue you may want to just lead it, let it be a little broad okay and sometimes you need to define it and squash all the BS but here I want to wait because the idea is it's the future we have streaming now but we don't know what all could be included in the types of formats that would be available in the future okay and so here I need to have a definition of Disney slash licensor slash licensee this is going to be any person or entity having ownership and rights in the picture having the right to license the right to use or sell or merely as any of the licensees i.e. Disney Plus, Netflix, whoever, to merely have the right to use or sell uh, the picture. Okay, And so these would all be declarations. I state the section of the contract where it goes. And so all I have to do is go back and plug this in to the contract when the time comes. I'll have my basis absolutely covered as it relates to this goal of the client. Now, when I look over at my end game issues, which I, something tells me, was completely lacking in Scarlett Johansson's contract, which is why she's ending up in court, because the whole purpose of a contract is so that you almost should never have to pull it out of the desk drawer. But if you do, it will have the end goal scenario for how any problems, breach, or default is to be carried out or to be uh, satisfied in the contract of in and of itself. And so even if you have to go to court, if there is a clear breach that can be clearly uh, adjudicated, then the terms for how that will be uh, Resolve is already written into the contract. And so that is what we talk about when we talk about in game issues. And there are three you have your neutral, you have your friendly, and your unfriendly. As we can clearly see, we have a blood in the water, unfriendly, what we call termination or default event. Okay? someone has defaulted uh, on the, in the contract. Now, there is a what I call a super problem solver uh, in the contract in one of what I, what I think is the most important provision in the contract in the business action section of the contract, section three, which is where you will find what I call the subject matter performance provision. It is the actual action covenant of the agreement that talks about the uh, subject matter performances that each party is giving in the contract. And if you have a condition that is tied to a subject matter performance provision problem that ramps up the uh, ability of the person on the receiving end of that promise. It ramps up their ability in the area of the end game indemnities and remedies. It gives that party, the non-breaching party, the ability to walk away, it gives them walk away rights, or if they want to continue the contract to give the breaching or defaulting party an opportunity to cure the breach. Okay. Now, another thing that 
I can see that is clearly lacking in the debilitating uh, consequences for breach in this agreement is a warranty. Uh, you seems like there was a lot of talk about what the parties thought the meaning of certain terms meant. Here at some point right in the beginning in the uh, background information, uh, Scarlett Johansson's attorney say both parties as well as Disney understood that this meant which theatrical release, why theatrical release, see they're really stuck to theatrical release, <laughs> initial the theatrical release, why theatrical release, I bet you go through that contract and you'll never find any other representation of any other type of viewing of the picture in there. But they talk about how both parties understood that this meant that the picture would initially be released exclusively in movie theaters and that it will remain exclusively in movie theaters for a period of between approximately 90 and 120 days. My thinking is really uh, how, how, how in the contract, uh, if, if this was understood, when I say understood, I mean in black and white in the contract, if this is written in the contract, we wouldn't be here today. And so when you, when I have, when I have this kind of fuzzy wording, fuzzy is like what I call loosey goosey. That tells me that these terms were not defined, which leads to the broad and blatant uh, ambiguity that seems to exist here. In addition, if this was an understanding that was, it would seem in this context to be one of the client's major business goals, you would make sure that it is tied to a representation and warranty in the representation and warranty section of the contract. And so in my uh, business issues worksheet analysis, if you review it more in depth, you'll find that one of the seven contract concepts is representations and warranties, which are found in the representations and warranties section. And representations and warranties are different from promises or covenants. Your representations and warranties are promises made to induce a party to enter into the contract. And they are true only as of a particular moment in time up until the time of closing or signing of the contract. And then you have your covenants, which are promises for a person to do something in the future. Totally two different things. And so on the one hand, you'll have your breach of contract, but you also have the ability to assert, if need be in litigation, a breach of warranty. And I can tell when I look at the causes of action here, I don't see anything about misrepresentation. I don't see anything about breach of warranty. So it remains to be seen. So uh, let's see what happens. I don't see anything that relates in any way, shape, form or fashion in the uh, complaint to an allegation or cause of action for breach of, of warranty or of negligent or intentional misrepresentation. Okay. So, uh, quickly defined. When we talk about a movie theater. So I, I know we all are like, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know what a movie theater means, but in contracts in civil litigation, it can mean one thing to one person and another thing to another one. You want to make sure that it is clear when you say movie theater, a brick and mortar movie theater where people go and get popcorn and buy tickets 
and go in and watch the movie with other you want to make sure everybody knows what you're talking about because I could find a way to slip a streaming situation into a movie theater but anyway so that may be a little bit extreme but that is the way that we use contract concepts ie a representation and warranty or a covenant to solve a business issue and so as you can see here uh, I have these arrows here because there will be an obligation in the remedies and indemnifications which is an end game provision the terminations the indemnities and remedies these are end game provisions what happened at the end of the term of the agreement and or in the event of any breach or default okay it also helps you to look into the future uh, to be able to broaden out uh, some things where need be to encapsulate and not be cut out but if that happens in any event of breach of a covenant or breach of a representation and warranty the uh, prescribed uh, consequences will be set forth here in the indemnities and remedies uh, provisions of the agreement for example so we'll control this risk by creating an obligation on behalf of Disney via any of its licensees or being uh, responsible for any of its licensees creating an obligation for Disney to defend and identify Scarlett Johansson in any litigation against any and all third parties that are selling the picture without making a royalty payment allocation assessment or without making a royalty payment okay so when Disney is looking at that thinking okay I'm gonna have to pay the cost and so when Disney is looking at the uh, scenario of them having to pay all costs associated with such a breach it'll make them think twice about breaching this term of the agreement either covenant or representation or warranty now if you enjoyed these tips I ask that you please give me a big thumbs up if you have any comments and you want to clap back please comment below but in any respect please subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the bell so you won't miss any of my tips and please also follow me on TikTok and Instagram.